Hello. So, um, Gigahertz Optic, we're um, uh, an optical radiation measurement company. We have a fairly comprehensive range of UV uh, measurement equipment. Um, our involvement with germicidal UV really dates back to the uh, 1990s. Obviously, that was mostly a, a exclusively low pressure mercury lamp work, which evolved over a number of years. And of course, um, with, the, with the COVID pandemic, um, a lot, of, lot more activity. So um, in, in practical terms, uh, much research safety measurements will require um, the, the, or involve the measurement of irradiance. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not here to announce a magic fluence um, meter. We, we are involved in measuring sort of planar irradiance. For which there, there's a you know a huge range of meters and uh, equipment available, and it, in a way it, it's it compared with the sort of tests and um, studies that need to be done in this area, it may seem a very very simple measurement that needs doing, but actually getting um, into in instrument agreement, getting two meters side by side and measuring the same irradiance um, has been notoriously difficult over over the years. And I just want to highlight some of the, uh, the sources of uh, measurement uncertainty when we are performing irradiance measurements. So obviously by, by definition, irradiance requires the instant radiation to be weighted by the, the cosine of the angle. So the, the, the cosine response of, of whether it's a radiometer or a spec radiometer is really crucial. And, and often it, it's a thing that's, that, that's neglected. And in our experience, um, it's often the dominant source of it source of error. Radiometers will generally be calibrated in with near uh, normal instant radiation. And of course, in, in our sort of applications here, we're often dealing with very extended sources so that the cosine response is, is very critical. Factors of two, three, not even, I'm not even talking percentages here, so very significant errors can occur. Most measurements are done with, with broadband radiometers rather than uh, spectra radiometers. And the ideal a uh, radiometer is going to have a perfectly flat response in the UV, completely block everything else. And of course, in practice, that that product can't be can't be manufactured. The result of that, and, and this is the I think the important point for anybody using a radiometer for any measurement, is that inherent in any radiometer is is a spectral mismatch error, unless the light source you're measuring has exactly the same spectral distribution as the light source that was used to calibrate the, 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 the radiometer. So this spectral mismatch really needs to be uh, assessed if you're performing any measurement with, with radiometers. The other thing just to point out, of course, is that most commercial UV radiometers will not successfully cover the, the, the far UVC range that we're interested in here. And another really key point is Commercially, most things are probably calibrated with a low pressure mercury lamp at 254. So it's, an, it's, it's you know, sort of a gross spectral mismatch um, condition. We can correct for the spectral um, mismatch. And as a company, we, we, we embed this in, in sort of the factors we, we, we put with, with the instruments to cover the different types of light sources that are used within this field. Um, but to do that, you, you need knowledge of these, these four, four parameters. And I would encourage anybody who's using radiometers uh, for, for, for measurements um, to at least do some, some assessment for themselves to determine the extent of spectral mismatch error in their measurements. So some of these aspects are, are fairly straightforward. So the, uh, the, the weighting function is either a straight line or it's going to be the, um, the, either the ACGIH or IGNOR curve. The spectral responsi responsivity of the detector, maybe you have to rely on just sort of um, typical data from the manufacturer, or if you're lucky, it may be in the calibration certificate. Maybe the, the more difficult things to, to find information on can be, um, well, there's probably typical data, widely available, obviously, if you're using the, the UCO or the Eden Park lamps, you probably get access to the, the typical spectral distribution of those. But actually finding out exactly what the... Um, uh, what the calibration source was that, that, that was used by your your supplier can be a real issue, and that's that's the point I really want to emphasise is that knowledge of the light source that was used to calibrate your radiometer is is, is fundamental. If you don't know that, you I would suggest you really don't know what it is you're you're, you're measuring. 
as I, yeah, so here you know, a couple of the the um the, the spectral distributions of, of the sources we're, we're likely to to encounter and of course there, there are subtle differences in these with the different manufacturers importantly whether there's a filter yes or no when we're just concerned with low pressure mercury lamps of course doing the the, the safety measurement was very very much simpler we had a nice convenient weight in factor a factor of 0.5 so we could just double the the the, the the, the measured irradiance, and we could determine the, uh, um, the, the the safety level. Of course, the, the situation with the, the type of sources we, we're using in the far UVC is rather more complicated. And the particularly when we when we apply the weighting, say so the ACGIH weighting, then the, the the subsidies in the in the filter that's used particularly will can have a significant impact on um, uh, the. The, the measurement we, we we achieve for the safety measurement. The other thing, also, just the, the absolute levels we're talking about. Often, the the, the threshold levels are, are really quite low when it comes to uh, um, do, doing the measurement with radiometers. So, practical example here: the absolute looking at the absolute sort of uh, responsivity of, of this commercial detector. The the ICNERB threshold level it equates to only a few tens of picoamps. So, you know, the, this is actually a demanding measurement just in terms of sensitivity, as as well as well, the other the, the other issues concerning um, the spectral distribution and uh, so forth. The other area that, that can also cause an issue, if we look at the responsivity of, of these um, these radiometers, they are not entirely um, blind to, to longer wavelengths. So, in, in ambient conditions, a, a, a very small signal um, can, you know, manifest itself as a as, as a significant um, error or a significant uh, level. So, uh, sometimes it, it's helpful to be able to use an, a, an external long pass filter and just establish whether there's some um, error there. If we move to spectroidometers, we think well, we can do away with all the worries about spectral mismatch, but we still have to. Um, with with care, determine a suitable instrument, and particularly for the for the safety measurements, if we look at the standards that do exist uh, and are employed, so the six two four seven one, which also relates to the artificial optical radiation directive in Europe, um, or even if even if we look at the ASTM uh, standard, that they're really advising that uh, measurements need to be done with a with a double monochromator system, or at least you need to be able to demonstrate that your measurements are equivalent to. In practice, um, it's far more, nearly everybody is, is, is using a ray-based spectrometers these days, they're far more convenient um, to, to use, fast, um, cost, everything. Um, schematics of these devices typically show a, a perfect little um, dispersed spectrum presented to, uh, to, to an array detector, but, it, but, but it, in a real instrument, um, the things are rather more complicated than that. There's you get multiple orders of diffraction and scattering and, and so on, so on. And all that this rises to the, the fundamental really limitation often of, of array-based spectrometers in the UV is the, their stray light performance. And this is why the, the standards um, rightly make um, a, an effort to point out the need for um, compatibility with results you achieve with a, with a double monochromator. In the UV, the calibration factors are are, are, are increasing because of the uh, the falling responsivity of devices. So any sort of stray light component uh, appears as a as an increasingly significant number. Manufacturers um, sometimes quote a, a stray light factor for for a, for a spectrometer, and unless the, unless they're specifying how that stray light is, is measured. I don't think it, it, it often doesn't mean anything. And you know, just say 1% or 3% if it, because the stray light will be very dependent on the source that you're measuring as well as the instrument itself. So with, a, with an array spectrometer, um, it is possible to um, implement a, a range of techniques to, uh, to, to mitigate the, these sort of stray light limitations, obviously good design components, um, filtering is useful. And ultimately, we can, um, with a tunable laser, fully characterize the, the stray light characteristics of a, of a spectrometer. And based on that, you can then apply, apply some stray light correction matrix and really get double monochromator-like performance with, with, a, with an array spectrometer. 
but the, the vast majority of commercial instruments will, will not offer that, that level of performance. Normally when I'm talking about UV spectrometers, I almost stop after talking about stray light, that limits everything. But um, if we're doing the safety measurements um, in accordance with the new, um, with the ACGIH um, uh, guidelines, you have to notice that the um, the action spectra there is, is extremely wavelength dependent around the 222 line. So here I've just simulated just, just shifting the spectrum around in steps of 0.2 nanometers and you, you immediately see a very gross um, uh, error in, introduced if you uh, if, if you shift that spectrum by by more than more than a small fraction of nanometers. And actually, the the recently published um, LM ninety three guidelines um, do in, include some some useful um, sort of pointers really in terms of the specification you need for a um, for, for a spectro radiometer. Um, with respect to its, its wavelength accuracy, um, bandpass function, it's, it's, it acknowledges the need for stray light correction, although it's maybe not so prescriptive there. The final point is the spectroideometers in practice will be calibrated with a, with, with a deuterium lamp. Um, these have nice smooth spectrums, but uh, um, their output is low. If your if your measurement system involves an integrating sphere in, in any way, um, fluorescence is something you really need to consider. But that's a whole separate talk. The point I just we just want to make here is a little re reality check, perhaps even um, if we send currently if, if we send a, um, a deuterium lamp to PTB to be calibrated, um, they would quote an uncertainty of around six percent at two twenty nanometers. So if you then use that to calibrate your spectroradiometer, there's an increased uncertainty. If you then use that calibrated spectroradiometer to do a measurement, there will be an increased uncertainty. If you're using a radiometer, that's probably um, going to be related back to a spectroradiometric measurement at some stage. And so maybe my punchline there is if, if you're achieve, achieving better than 10% um, measurement uncertainty, you're, I would say you're probably doing, do, do, doing well. So just in summary, just to highlight those points, good cosine response, that, that, that's essential. Um, we're using radiometers, under, understand the implications of, of spectral mismatch errors and the, uh, the um, realize that if you're doing safety measurements, then the, 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 you need some knowledge of the spectral distribution of the source you're, you're measuring. Spectral radiometers look at the, 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 the scatter light performance, but important the wavelength accuracy um, if you're uh, doing measurements of, of XMR lamps. And the point to really emphasize to everybody is under, you know, know what light source is being used to calibrate your, your meter. Thank you. May we take one quick question? No question, just there. So uh, it's uh, two quick questions. What's the uh, photo detector material that you use in your radiometers? And can you comment on the utility of solar blind photo detectors like silicon carbide photodiodes or CZ-myod pho photomultipliers, those kind of things, for, for getting rid of the interference from the longer wavelengths? Okay. Um, we, we use a range of materials for, to cover the far UVC um, I think it'd be uh, an algan type um, photo detect material. I think in any of these devices, when you really look closely at them, um, they're never completely solar blind. And because of um, it, because of the huge dynamic range in the in the um, ACGIH curve, um, they they can become relevant. You know that you, you do have to be aware of of the uh, um, that sort of outer band response. Yeah. Thanks very much.